the videos, the video we saw about praying was fantastic. Um, it makes me think of myself and my prayer life. It also shows the growth that I'm having in, in Christ currently because, you know, I'm one of those results-oriented kind of guys, right? I'm one of those people that's always on the move, always doing things, always got something happening. And even in prayer, for a pattern of my life, it's always been, I'm one of those guys that get in, I pray, I get out, right? Like I'm done, and I think that that's about it. And I can see how God has been changing me to even a point where spiritual disciplines like solitude and sitting there and being still and listening to God speak is growing a lot. Where days where I'm struggling and days that I'm tired and days I'm frustrated, and I realize, oh yes, I, I didn't have I didn't have my time alone listening to God today. And I didn't I didn't have that time to just be still and know that He's God and. And it's just great to see how different people in different ways can have different prayer lives um, and how God is changing that. But today we're going to talk about prayer in terms of a praying church. That is the title of the message today, it's a praying church. And it is both corporately and individually a praying church. It is how we as individual members of Christ's body, as the church, are praying individual for our own spiritual walk with God, and it is also how we corporately as a church, and corporately as the big church of God's churches throughout North America and throughout the rest of the world, can be praying as a pattern of a habitual, consistent pattern of behavior. That's what we're going to talk about today. Prayer can be a very difficult thing for many people. Like I said, I kind of get in and I, I've, I've been known to say my thing and be done and I'm kind of a quick prayer. There are some people that pray for a very long time. We've saw the lister that's just listing off all these other things. We've seen the arm swingers and we saw this whole video today that showed all these different ways of prayer. And to be honest with you, prayer is one thing that many people are very uncomfortable with. Many people are uncomfortable with sharing the gospel with people because they're afraid what other people are going to think. And many people are afraid of praying because they're afraid of what God may think. I don't pray right. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray for. I don't know if I should just repeat verses that my churches have told me about or if I should sit there and I just talk to God uh, from my heart. I don't know... Do I just rattle off a hundred things of things that I want? And if we can be honest, many of us do that. We're a pattern of prayer for us is saying, God, I want this. I need this. Please give me this. I'd like it if you had this. That's fantastic for that person, but I really want this, 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 and the other thing. By the way, one more thing. <laughs> Amen. Your will be done. Right? And that's a pattern of prayer for a lot of people. And to be honest with you, sometimes I feel when I talk, we all know that I, I, I have the gift of gab, right? It's, it's, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure it was accidentally left out of here for the spiritual gifts, but gab could be included in my perception. But I'm sure there's, I can feel sometimes when I pray, I think sometimes God's like, okay, just stop talking and let me speak to you for a while. And, and that's something that I'm growing in. Let me just listen to God speak to my soul. So prayer is a difficult thing. So as we're looking at it from a praying church and we're looking at it from how we pray and what to say when we pray, I think Paul does a very good job of giving that explanation and illustration here. If you open up your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is right behind um, Philippians. Paul wrote the letter to Colossae. It's for the Christians in Colossae. He wrote it in about 62 AD. It's when he was in prison in Rome. And basically, he's writing about the Christian life and that Jesus, uh, Jesus is supreme. Jesus is, uh, died for the forgiveness of our sins. And he's writing about Christian behavior. And then uh, if you read chapter 1, verses 9 through 14 is where we're going to be at today. Starting in verse 9, it says, For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We, not, that's it. Like, that's the whole topic. He says, we have not stopped praying for you. Then he goes into more detail about that. So he says, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way 
bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have the great endurance and patience. May giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. How fantastic is that? Let us pray over that scripture for one second, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we ask that we can open up our eyes to see your word clearly, Lord, and we ask that you can teach us. Let the messenger be small, but let your message be big, Lord, and we just want to rest on you, to focus on you, and have us changed by your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See, when I look at this, and I start reading it in verse 9, There's one word that really stuck out to me for a while in verse 9. And it says, For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And I'm going to pause there for a second because I want to think about being filled. I want to think about what it means to be filled. And I think sometimes we, we read that and we look at that. And if you're anything like me, a lot of times... We have a tendency to skip over things like that. But every word in the Bible is important. So as you're reading this and we're thinking about being filled, I thought, okay, well, what happens if we're not filled? We, we want to be filled, but what happens if we're not? There's, there's a little example here. I have, I have this, little, this little guy, this little plastic vase, if you will. It, I think it's held flowers at some point or change or something. So some things around my house. It's multi-purpose, really. That's really what it is. It's, it's multi-purpose. It does a lot of things. It comes in handy a lot of times. But if we are followers of Jesus Christ and we can look at it and let's pretend this was all dirty and, and dusty and we become new Christians and we profess faith in Christ and we become a new creation, right? So then all the dust that was on here could be clean. Like now, now we're here. We are a clean vase, plastic vase. That's us. That is the Christian New Christian, brand new Christian. But it's empty. It's empty, just like many brand new Christians are empty. It is a situation where if, if someone here is dying of thirst, they're not going to get anything here. In this world, if we can be honest, I think is dying of thirst. They're dying of thirst not having been filled with Christ that's quenching their thirst, that's giving them life, that's important to have. And many times you can't come to, to the brand new Christian for those things because it doesn't have anything to give. I'm not saying brand new Christians don't have anything in that regard to give, but what I'm saying is they themselves need to be filled. When they themselves are filled, they can then fill others. It's like that picture of, you ever see those really fancy hotels like I have on TV, right? And you've got that one champagne glass. They've got the champagne glass pyramid. You know what I'm talking about? And they, they pour out all that champagne or water or what have you. They put it, and they fill the top glass. And then it overflows. It goes to the glasses underneath. And it overflows. It goes to the glasses underneath. It overflows and goes to the glasses underneath. So all the glasses are filled, right? That's how I feel that the Christian life should be. That's being filled. The top glass. We want to be the top glass. Right? So what does that look like? Thank you for asking. I, have, I asked Dick Charlton if he'd be able to come and help me today. So if Dick can come up here, he's just, he is ready to be, uh, yeah, he's, he's ready to be a part of this. I can sense the excitement, right? Can you hold this, please? Hold it high. That's showing everybody who we are. That's us, the new Christian, right? There's people that are professing faith in Christ that, but it needs something. Because as we're reading in the scripture, it says that we ask continually to God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So we want God to fill us. So if that's us, what do we need? God, exactly right. Thank you for answering that. Okay, so this, this is God. Okay? 
And yes, I think he's a Bears fan. <laughs> okay? Not, not ashamed of that, that what, whatsoever. Right? So that, that's God. Oh, you know what? I don't want to get in trouble. So, this looks like it's a bad idea. Right? But that's okay. This looks like it's a good idea. That looks so much better now, right? We just do it all the way here, right? So, what we want to do is we want God, who is so much bigger than we are in every way, right? We want God to pour into us as life goes on. And maybe that is filling us with a prayer life at this point. But maybe we don't go to church. Maybe we don't have communion with other people, relationships. We're not doing life with others. We're just learning to pray, but we don't read the Bible because we don't really know what it means. But as your Christian life grows... And you start paying attention to God more, and you go to, to church more, you pray more, you read the Bible more, you follow God more, you trust in Him more. God is going to continue to fill you with the knowledge, His wisdom, His power. Is that pretty full? That's good, right? Well, a lot of people come and you can quench some thirst, right? We don't want to just be a church of individual people that are following God, that are just getting a little bit, and then we're filling a couple people. We want to be pretty full, right? But I would suggest that maybe we don't want to just be full. We want to be that top champagne glass, don't we? In order for that to happen, you need God to continually fill you so you're overflowing with His knowledge, His love, His patience. And as life goes on, he's constantly pouring into you. You're overflowing. That even the glasses and the cups and everything underneath you are getting filled. Because God is the source that's filling you. Now, you are not just quenching one person's thirst who's in desperate need for God. You're quenching everything that's underneath you. That not only, thank you, Dick. Can you clap it up for Dick? He did. Thank you. You know, I did all this and I put all this stuff. I got the pool. I never thought of the towel. <laughs> My apologies. See, but everything else in contact with this is wet. And when this was once empty, it's filled. And it's filled with the contents that was in the first bucket. And that's what God's doing. God is investing in you and giving into you what was in him and what is from him. So that you don't sit there and go, hey, I turned this all blue on my own. You say, I am a result of the source that gave it to me. So we all know that this was nothing, but what was in something was that heavy blue container that came up. And that's giving glory and honor to God. And that what affects you gets everything else and everyone else wet that touches it. My hands are wet. Dick's hands are wet. The pool is wet. The carpet is not. <laughs> it could be. But that's what it means to be filled. We want to be filled. So in the same result, we're looking at it from that, from that area of being filled. And God is the one who's filling. See, the King James Version and the ESV talk about may you be continuously filled. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual act. It's a continual action. We are a result of being filled. So as we're talking about being filled, and as you're going to take your notes today, we, in the notes it looks like it's a cup. That's the cup that we're filling. We're filling that container today. And one of the ways that we're doing it is in prayer. I know people struggle with prayer, but let's see. This lays out what we can do as Christians who are praying. A praying church individually and a praying church corporately. This results to both. There's four principles in here. So as we continue to read, we can look at this and we'll see the, we'll see the first one. Point number one, first thing we want to pray for is we want to pray for multiplicity. Pray for multiplicity. That's in verses 9 and 10. I, read, I already read most of one being filled. Go, uh, verse 9, going into 10, it says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, 
This is where it starts showing them down. Number one, bearing fruit in every good work. It says it right there in verse 10. Bearing fruit in every good work. A Christian bears fruit. Right? You ever go by the trees and you see some trees that have absolutely nothing on it? You have some trees that are fully blossom, fully green. Just drive down the highway, you'll see a bunch of different types of trees. Some are very empty. Those empty ones are not alive. They're dead. They're not bearing anything. You might as well chop them up and throw them away. But they're still standing. And we have some Christians today that are still standing. They're not bearing any leaves. They're not bearing any fruit. They're not bearing anything. They're just there. They're firewood. Their life is stagnant. It, it needs life. It needs life infused into it. We need to bear fruit. We need to pray for multiplicity. That's what I talk about with bearing fruit. We need to be pray for multiplicity that things that we have multiply onto others. So, for example, we as individual Christians, we need to maybe multiply disciples with others. We need to have more disciples come and be a part of our lives. We need to ask for God to multiply our friends, multiply our families, Christians to pour into us, and non-Christians that we can pour into. Right? We need to have a communion relationship with many people that we can continue to multiply to, that they can go and then multiply. We need to maybe ask God to have a, a multi, multiply our personal friends and ministry, or the, multiply the church and the ministries in the church. It's not just this local church body. It is that God is going to multiply his churches in the world that people are going to have access to understand the gospel message. That God is going to multiply his church, his followers, his people. It starts with one church, which, which grows enough that you have another church, which grows enough that has another church. Right? For example, if this entire service was full, and the first service was completely full, and we have standing room only, we may need to multiply the amount of services that we have. So now you have a third service. Maybe have a fourth service. Maybe we're so busy on Sundays, we need to multiply our days and have a Saturday night service or a Saturday morning service. Maybe this church gets so big, you have to multiply the churches and maybe add on an extension and multiply the size of the... What I'm saying is, it's a history and a pattern of multiplicity. So we can pray to God and say, I mean, look... We have a baptistry here, right? Multiply the amount of people that are going to come to Christ and get baptized. Let's multiply the amount of baptisms that we have. Praise God for that. How do we pray to God? We pray for multiplicity that us as individual Christians can bear fruit and other people are going to be able to take it and other people are going to be able to bear fruit. It's a pattern of multiplicity. So you ask, a way to ask God for multiplicity is you say, God... How can I use my gifts to multiply your people? Because God's given you all gifts. God, how, how can I use my gifts to multiply your church? Your people. Your followers. The second thing we want to pray for is we want to pray for growth. That's the second aspect. We want to make sure we pray for growth. Benny, can we adjust the PowerPoint, please? So it shows that we, so we make sure where we stand. Thank you. In verse 10 it says, So that uh, you may live a life worthy of the Lord, please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. We want to pray for growth. That we can grow in our own knowledge of God. Many people don't share the gospel because they're afraid or insecure of their knowledge. Well, I, I, I don't ha what happens if I don't have all the answers? What happens if somebody asks me a question that I don't know the answer to? I'm going to look foolish. Or if I try and tell them about God and they come to me with, with a rebuttal on something and I don't know what to say. What happens if I don't know what to say to somebody? My words that I say are inadequate. And the things that I, my lack of knowledge, I, I, don't, I don't know the Bible well enough to show them a specific verse. I, I, don't, I don't know. And then you start questioning yourself and you start doubting yourself. And guess what ends up happening? Your mouth stays quiet. And people's ears that are open to hear don't hear anything because nothing comes out because we're so focused on ourselves and we're like, in terms of like, I, my inadequacy. We need to change that. Change that perspective around and go, you know what, you're absolutely right. We don't know enough. Myself included. None of us know enough. But guess what? God does. Pray to God, he's going to give you the answers. 
right? Step out in faith and then have that conversation. And then you can tell your friends at church and go, I didn't even know that, but God spoke to the person through me. Wow. And then everybody else is going to go, great. And then they're going to try it, right? And what happens is it's okay not to know all the answers. It's okay. If you don't know the answers to say something, you say, you know what? I don't know the answer. That's a very good question. Let's figure this out together. Let's learn this together. And you bring them along with you. I mean, I, I am the king of not saying the right things. Right? I have a history of putting my foot in my mouth all the time. Just ask Nicole. She'll probably give you a list of examples. Right? Lovingly. I get it. It's totally fine. But, it doesn't mean I don't stop. Because I would rather go up and go, hey, I'm sorry that that didn't come out right, or I should have I said it this way, or as opposed to not saying anything at all. So we need to pray for our knowledge in Christ. We need to maybe ask God to grow us in our maturity of Christ. Maybe we need to ask God to grow us in our desire to know him better and to know him closer, individually and corporately. Maybe we can ask God to grow our church services, our, our church and mountain people. Maybe we can ask God to grow uh, his churches more that they're not just opening up, but they're thriving and that they're growing, therefore that they're multiplying. Maybe we're asking that God, we can say, hey, let's, have, let's invest in one more person so you can grow in me, that I can help them grow. And we're growing as people, not just multiplying. There's a difference between multiplication and growth. Sometimes we link them together. I think there's a distinct difference. We want to pray for multiplicity for certain things. We also want to pray for growth for certain things. Grow us in our spiritual discipline. I explained in the beginning where I was kind of walking in. I'd, I'd do the quick prayer, and act, be good, but not spend time in solitude, not spend time focusing and listening in God, being still in the quiet, and just resting in God and listening to Him. But that's, a, that's my personal heart. That's where I'm growing. I wish we can all show each other where we're growing. Sometimes we don't tell each other where we're growing because we're afraid of what other people think. We don't tell each other our struggles because we're afraid of what other people think. God, help us for that and forgive us for that. Because I have no problem coming up to you telling me my, my inadequacies. I do it all the time. I know that coming in and just having a quick prayer and being done, like that, that's not, to me, now, authentic prayer. That's, it, it is at the time, but that's not me growing in prayer. But now I want, I want to sit and listen. And, and my prayer time has gotten longer. And I can't wait to come to you in a couple more years as my prayer continues to go, yeah, not only was I here, not only was I here, but now I'm here. And you can see the pattern of growth in people's lives. But it all starts somewhere. When we take seeds that are going to plant flowers, we don't laugh at the seeds. Because we look at what the result is. I never walked in to a store that is selling seeds that just has a picture of other seeds attached to the seeds. It shows you what the flower will become. Right? You see and go, oh, that's going to look good. These seeds are going to produce that flower. But we, have it. we think that other people are going to see our seeds and pictures of seeds. And it's okay to plant the seeds. It's okay to be this big right now. Because eventually you're going to be that flower. We all will. So embrace the seeds. Plant the seeds. Water the seeds. Nourish the seeds. Knowing it's going to eventually blossom. It's going to blossom to something beautiful. That's our Christian walk. That's our Christian life. God sees you as seeds and loves you as seeds and wants to water you in good soil so you can blossom. That's growth. It's like a tree that has deep roots. That no matter how much you try and chop it down, no matter how much you try and take a shovel and dig it up, it's one of those hardest things to do because it's so big. It's a mature tree. That's what we want to be. That's growth. That's, that's godly growth. Who's giving it to us. So maybe you can pray, God, please help me grow. Please grow me individually. Please grow our congregation. Please grow our city or our town or our neighborhood. Please grow our block. Please grow your followers. Please grow my family. Please grow me so I can help grow my family. And then the family can multiply. 
So we want to pray for multiplicity. We want to pray for growth. Thirdly, in verse 11, we want to pray for strength. Because it says right there, being strengthened with all the power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. So you may have endurance and patience. So God, please give us strength to endure over a period of time. Please give us strength to have endurance. I, I, can't, I can't run very far. You know, I'm... Um, I know, I'm not a long distance runner. It's total shock, I can tell, right? But I don't have any endurance. I mean, I would hate to d even think about demonstrate, but I run a little bit, I'm, uh, you know, breathing heavy. And I don't, I just, that's just not me. I don't, ha I don't have endurance, right? I don't have that endurance to have that time. If I were to try, not only am I out of breath, but my legs are going to start hurting, my arms are going to start hurting, my lungs are going to start hurting, everything, and my, whole, my hair will start hurting, right? <laughs> Those are reasons why I don't run. But in order for you to get endurance and to run over a long period of time, you need to have muscles. And your muscles are going to become strengthened. You, you ever work out one time and go, man, I'm so sore in ways I in areas I never thought I even had? Yeah, it's because your muscles need to be strengthened. God, strengthen our muscles even in areas we don't think about so we can be having time of patience and endurance for you. Be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. We've got to pray for strength. If we have the muscles, we can start running. The more you start running, the more endurance you have. Next thing you know, you become a long-distance long runner. We, got, we need the strength for that first. We need to ask God to strengthen us to speak for him boldly. We need to ask God to strengthen us to doing his work and his ministry. We need to pray for strength, maybe to endure persecution. We had a prayer request about that. Imagine the pastor in Turkey that doesn't have strength to endure the persecution that he's in. In times of difficulty, we need, time, we need strength. You know, I've talked to many people who've had accidents, and they said, hey, you, you may, doctors have told them you wouldn't have made it if you weren't in such great shape. Have you ever heard that before? Athletes have said that all the time. Because they've had the strength. They've invested. They're not sitting there going, one day I'm going to have an accident and, and the, the strength that I've been putting on my body and the muscles that I've had for a long time and the way that my body has been working out for a long period of time is going to allow me to live because of that accident. But because you've been enduring all this and because you've been g growing in your strength, you can endure when the accident comes eventually, if it happened at all. I remember a lot of those stories from all those athletes that have said stuff like that. The people, if my body was not in good shape, I would not be walking today. Or I've, I know a person who had a stroke that used to be a professional athlete, and you would never know that this individual had a stroke because he was in good shape. He still does things today, working and doing things outside. It's like, wow, you'd never know it. You need that kind of strength. Maybe we don't just need strength for ourselves. Maybe we need strength for others. Perhaps, if you will with me, the name is Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene. And what happens is, we are told in the Bible to carry your cross. But maybe, it's not just about your cross that you need to carry. Maybe you need to be strong that you can carry somebody else's cross. Simon of Cyre was a man who carried the cross of Jesus Christ as Jesus was on his way to be crucified. Can you imagine going up to somebody else and just carrying their cross? Taking the burden that's on their shoulders and lifting that so they can be alleviated and they can walk to their destination. God, give us the strength for that. We want to be having the strength like Simon. So you pray something and say, God, what spiritual muscles do I need to be focused on to make me stronger? What areas, what's, what muscles specifically do I need? Maybe it's patience. Maybe it's more prayer. Maybe it's Bible study. Maybe it's tithing. 
more. Maybe it's loving others. Maybe it's helping the needy. What areas in your lives do you need God to work in and strengthen in your life so you can be strong to endure for Him? Lastly, verses 12 through 14, the lesson we want to pray for is we want to pray for gratitude. Pray for gratitude. Verses 12 through 14, it says, And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified to you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for that. It's an attitude of gratitude, and that's what I think we need to pray for. See, so many times we grumble, if we can be honest, and we grumble about different things in our lives, and that grumbling leads to more grumbling, which means to more anger, you know, and it, just, it becomes toxic. But if we have an attitude of gratitude, instead of going outside and saying, oh, it's so hot, you know, all due respect, I was grumbling a lot yesterday, quietly. But I'm like, oh, this is hot. And I was, I was wearing something like this, right? A shirt with like an undershirt underneath, right? Because I'm not smart. <laughs> Just not smart with that. But that's what I did. I thought I was being fashionable out in the heat. But it was hot. And I wasn't like, thank you for air conditioning that I'm going to go into. And thank you. I was when I got in the air conditioning. I said, thank you for the air conditioning. Right? But when it's going to be negative 10 degrees outside in a few months, we're going to look at... To, Days like today and yesterday and go, thank you for the heat when we have it. Right? We're going to be crumbling when it's negative 10, if you're anything like me. Right? What we need to do is find something to be thankful for. Instead of saying where I was yesterday, the heat that I was in, I, wanna, I need to be thankful for the people that I'm with. Or I need to be thankful for the moment that I share. Or the thankful for the beauty that he has created in the world. And everything that's out there. And everything that he's made. And everything that he's done. Just thank you, for, thank you for the cool breeze that came for five seconds. Thank you for that. Right? Just having a, an attitude of gratitude for a period of time. And we can sit there and look at this and it says, For he has rescued us from the dominion and darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for protecting me. God, thank you for my health. Thank you for my physical blessings. Thank you for my friends. My, you can do the Lister one that we saw up here on the video. And just thank God for all the things that he's done. As you're going through your day, carry a notebook and just go, you know, I'm going to be thankful today for this. Or things that can happen. Go, you know, I'm going I'm to be th Thank you, God, for this. And just write things down. Just for, make yourself a list of just things that you can be thankful for. Drive down the street. and th Thank you, God, for the restaurants that we have down the street. Thank you, God, for the community that we live in. Thank you for the cars that we drive. Thank you for the roads that we're on. Thank you for the weather that we have that we're not stuck on the side of the road. Thank you for the fact that we're not stuck on the side of the road. Right? All these other things we can just be thankful for. And over a period of time, it becomes an attitude of gratitude where other people are there and just like, thank God, thank you God, thank you God. And you can be the other guy in that video where people are praying and you have that one person's eye going, yes, Jesus, thank you. <laughs> but wouldn't that be great if that becomes the pattern of our lives? The last thing I want to talk about with that is in verse 12. He says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of God's holy people. Thank you for qualifying me to share in the inheritance. I've been authorized to do things because I'm the child of God to share in his inheritance. I'm qualified to do things because I'm a child of God. That's what it's saying here. So, for example... Maybe I can't share the gospel because I, I didn't go to, to seminary school or I, didn't, I don't have the education like the pastors here at Western Grove or I, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. Okay, so you're qualified. You're qualified because Jesus died for you. Even some people don't even open up this book to show you because they're afraid, but they're going to go, you know what? I, I don't know this well enough, but I'll tell you this. This is how God has worked in my life. These are things that God has done. So, so you have qualifications. If I walked in right now to Walt Disney World and I said, I want to be the CEO to do that, they would laugh at me, right? And, let, and let's say they took me serious for three seconds, okay? They're going to ask for a sheet of paper. You know what the sheet of paper is going to say? 
They're gonna ask me for my resume. Because my re resume shows my what? Qualifications. It shows my work history. It shows what I've done. It shows, hey, I feel that I can lead this organization and this company because of this sheet of paper. And let's say my resume that I hand them says, I frequent Walt Disney World as my vacation spot of destination. Thank you. <laughs> and they say, oh, so you want to be the CEO of Walt Disney World because you come here often. And I'll say, well, not often because it's expensive. But that's one of the first things I'd change if I was the CEO of Walt Disney World. We'll lower the prices so more people could come. Right? And they'd say, thank you, but no thank you. Like, I wouldn't even make it to the secretary of the CEO's administrative offices or anything. I'd make it to, like, the secretary's secretary. Right? Because I'm not qualified for that. There's a million places out there that I'm not qualified for. I get it, but I'll tell you this. Everybody in this room is qualified to share the gospel of Christ. Every person in this room is qualified to talk to other people, to read the Bible, to pray more. You're all qualified. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of what Jesus has already done for you. If I walked in day one as the CEO of Walt Disney World, the staff of Walt Disney World is not going to look at me and say, what is your qualifications? They're going to say, he's the CEO of Walt Disney World. Why? Because he was hired as such. Because the, somebody hired him and gave him that position. Therefore, he has a position and he's doing the work of the position. Why? Because he was hired. You've all been bought. You've all been hired by Jesus. You're all qualified. I know, standing here preaching to you today, and I say this all the time, I am completely inadequate to stand here and talk to you. I am a sinner talking to sinners. Reading a book that God gave to sinners even Paul says that I am the foremost of. We're all inadequate. But that's where our attitude of gratitude comes in and say, thank you, Jesus, for making me qualified because of what you've done. And I'm just standing here talking to you today, telling you that I'm only here because of what Jesus has done. And you can all talk to people because of what Jesus has done. And that develops the attitude of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. So the one question you ask in your prayer is to God is, what areas in my life do I need to focus on to be more grateful? How can I be more grateful for you? And then be thankful to him for everything. And as we close, we're going to pray. And as we pray, we're going to take communion afterwards. But as we pray, I would like you to take just a moment. We'll have a moment of silence, and I want you to pray to God. And I want you to ask God those questions of things to pray for. Not those exactly, but you can just sit there and pray. God, how do I multiply your church and your people in this world? Give me multiplicity. God, help me grow in you. God, help me be strong in you. God, let me be thankful for you. And then when we're done at this time, I'll pray. And then after our prayer, the communion will be prepared. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can come and partake the communion. I'm not going to say anything. When I'm done praying, continue to pray if you need to. When you're done, come and partake in your communion at your time. And then we will finish our service and worship God together. Take a moment and pray those questions to God, please. Heavenly Father, let us multiply the followers of Jesus Christ. Let us have a pattern of multiplicity, Lord, that we can multiply works for you, multiply people for you, multiply baptisms for you, multiply ministries for you. 
Help us grow in You, God. That we can be strong. That we can grow in You, for You. That we can help grow others to worship You and follow You. We ask that You can grow our city, our town, our congregation. Grow our friends and our family, Lord, that we can focus on You and that we can grow them. But God, give us strength that we can be strong for You, that we can be strong to stand before You with other people of things that we've poured into. Lord, that we can be strong for them, that we can carry their cross along with our own, Lord. It's the only strength that You have that You can pour into us, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for You for all things, God. We are so thankful that You died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. We're so thankful for the life that You've given us, that You made us go from death to life, Lord. We want to worship you and praise you for all things, Lord. And even as we're going to take communion, Lord, thank you for the sacrifice you've given us. Let us come before you with fear and trembling at the communion table to focus on the awe of who you are. And we ask that you can continue to manifest in our body and in our mind and in our soul of everything that you become, Lord. We just want to praise you and worship you and take the elements to focus on you and just adoration and thankfulness for the sacrifice that you made. Because though we were still sinners, you died for us. And you died for us because you love us. That you lo so loved the world that you gave your son. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for making us qualified. Thank you, God. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.